sanitizer that has been provided by Dr. Bruner and I've got a plastic shield right here so I'm going to remove my mask because I want everybody to be able to see my face as I introduce really an interesting guest to the city of Chula Vista. We're so honored to have you Alex here. Um, his name is Alex Vesely um, Frankel and he is the grandson of Victor Frankel and I know that many of you that have gone on to um, the university um, have had to read this book which is called Man's Search for Meeting and Victor wrote this shortly after World War II but what's amazing about this is that he is a renowned um, psychiatrist that you would think that with all of his experiences in the concentration camps that he would have turned into a bitter man instead he used that dehumanization that he experienced in the camps to really reverse it and get back to healing and really humanize himself and be able to become just a fabulous psychotherapist and teacher to us all. So you have a lot to be thankful for um, Alex. We do um, for his brilliance and his compassion and we are so honored to have you here to speak about your grandfather Victor E. Frankel and what he did for many concentration vet, uh, victims during the Holocaust. And here to conduct the interview is a very dear friend of mine that I've met um, during the, her creation of this exhibit, um, Remember Us the Holocaust. It's my dear friend, Sandy Scheller, and she's going to talk about, and, and Alex is gonna talk about, the very close connection that her mother had with your grandfather, and it's going to be an amazing story. Yes. Yeah. Alex, Hi. how are you? I'm good. Just amazing. Um, this is my first time that I've met you, but of course, thank you, uh, Facebook and Instant Messenger, that we can communicate. And my way of finding you was when I was going through the trunks of items that I had and coming upon a cartoon that you hadn't seen that your grandfather did. And I believe for eight hours, we were still trying to search, what else do you have? What else do you have? What else do you have? And since then, we've become very, very good buddies and supportive of one another. I don't want to lose this. This is the first edition, second edition, one of the original 60s. So please keep this in your possession. And so when we will relate, we will go with this one. What I remember about Victor being all these years here in beautiful Chula Vista, he would come for Passover. And I just remember that he would be drawing. And I know there's one that he did on a napkin and I'm still trying to find it. And when I tried to draw on the napkin, my grandmother and mother were horrified. Only Victor can do it. Only Victor can do it. You mean on the same napkin? Yeah, no, you know that, that I had my napkin at Passover and then he had his. And my mother collected them. She was the collector because this was the famed Victor Frankel. Tell me about you because you have an incredible history and as your grandfather would say to you, I'm Victor Frankel, but Alex Vesely is my grandson, and he has a life. I want to hear all about you. Oh, well, well where to start? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that, that we met and that the technology is there today for mm -hmm. um, people to meet this way. I saw that, that um, drawing on Facebook, and I immediately recognized it as, yeah, that's that's an original victor. <laughs> so, um, and what an honor 
to be here and uh, to see the work you're doing in this beautiful exhibition. Thanks. It's marvelous. Um, about me, I'm, I collect stories. That's what I do. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I started uh, digitizing and archiving my grandfather's work Amazing. when I was a teenager. And it's a process that still goes on today. Um, I do photography. I um, am also a licensed psychotherapist, and mm -hmm. I studied logotherapy uh, with uh, not with my grandfather. I had to learn it just like everybody really? else can learn it. I learned really, it. I was fortunate because I learned it from uh, a lady who was a student of his, and she really took logotherapy to the next level with uh, her work. Her name is Elizabeth Lucas, mm -hmm. and um, just a wonderful. Um, therapist and author and um, so it's a mixture of all these things that that I do and that it just uh, never it never gets boring because yeah. due to the luck that um, I've had my grandfather and I experienced him for 23 years in my life so uh, he's very present every day mm -hmm. um, I get to meet uh, wonderful people such as yourself yeah. We talked earlier about something, and for me, this is the first time you've heard where your grandfather was still, a, he w was in Theresian mm -hmm. after Auschwitz, my mother being in Uteron with my grandmother. And here, the gates open, and my grandparents have not even a clue what to do. And Victor, th who was a dear friend because of his brother, because of Walter, and Walter had passed, Victor's wife had passed. My grandparents don't have a clue from what Ruthie told me. And here's your grandfather, already a top psychologist, understanding his own thing so the newness of the holocaust and being in a camp and he saves my grandmother i asked you earlier do you know of anybody else who was saved by your grandfather no. i'm shocked i i would think that every second generation or third generation would reach out to you and say by the way do you know what my grand what what your grandfather did? You're the first, and, wow. and I'm really um, this is so exciting for me too because I knew of the stories. I mean, he mentioned a couple of times that he had uh, gotten people out of trouble, uh, out of harm's way by forging diagnosis. He did that before the war and during the war as well. That's exactly what he did. He he forged a diagnosis on my grandmother saying that she was um, mentally not capable and for three months was in an American hospital and that is what happened. Um, then later on they were able to go back to Czechoslovakia. It was horrific what they went back to. I will then, it, it's in the book as far as how my mother and father came to the United States, but it opened the door for my grandparents to come here as well. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you that for the rest of my life, I will be so internally, internally grateful for that. And I, I thought for sure that other people would come out and maybe after this interview, people will understand the importance for you and what you do and how you're the collector of the stories. Yes. So, but uh, yeah, I'm so glad that um, uh, you know that's, that he was able to do that, and, and um, it doesn't surprise me that because I knew that early on that long that was long before the war that um, he had this passion about people, and if you read Man's Search for Meaning, you'll I see have that many even, times even in there <laughs> that he had this. Um, two character traits within him and uh, one was to be very clear and, and, and stern about his ideas and what was right and what was wrong and that goes back to his father 
uh, he would say that his father was a very just man mm -hmm. he was a thinker um, very very logical in his reasoning and in his uh, when he made a decision you know that that was it and uh, but he also had this heart that was on fire very very much um, uh, a loving person which he in he always said he inherited that from his mother that mm -hmm. side and so when there when there was a conflict um, between the two and he had, he had to make difficult choices um, such as, for example, the choice, should I leave the country, should I leave Austria, uh, which he could, he had a visa to emigrate to the U.S., mm -hmm. um, should I go there and start a new life and continue the work? He had already developed his own theories uh, of logotherapy and uh, help people with my knowledge, with my expertise there. He could have done a lot of good. Uh, or should I stay in Vienna and protect my parents because they needed doctors and he could, uh, for a while at least, uh, his family, which by then consisted of his old parents, protect them from deportation. Um, he chose to stay and to rather uh, put the parents and the, the love and loyalty that he had to the family above everything else. Um, that's just that was just his his character that was his way of being um to choose with the heart and whenever he saw that he could help uh and that he could make a, even a little bit of a difference for a people who were hurting who were suffering then he would do his best that was just uh, something that was so ingrained in his personality that um, um i think a lot of uh this these stories are so beautiful to see them not just coming from him but um, hearing them from from you and the people who really were affected mm -hmm. uh, by those decisions the opening in the book the first thing you read is a word you use the choice and in that part where he, I'm trying to remember how he did it, that he could have continued being miserable because of what he went through in the Holocaust, but he had the choice to realize that there were things about the Holocaust. He's the only person I know to have ever done this, so if I misquote, you'll, you'll, get, you'll put me on the right track. Mm -hmm. There are some people that by going in the Holocaust, they didn't have to worry about where they were going to sleep, not how they were going to sleep, but where they were going to sleep what they were going to eat because it was all done for them and by having all those freedoms taken away i believe victor said there was a sense of freedom there not the one that they wanted but there was that sense and i remember reading this over and over and over and over and over again and even to this day looking at new ways of analyzing things what I loved about Viktor Frankl then and what I love about Viktor Frankl now is it's very easy for somebody to become a parrot or to be able to come up with an idea and take it out into this intellectual way of communicating. Viktor made this book for somebody even in junior high to read and to understand because the first thing you need to do is to know what the Holocaust was and then you can apply how you have something so horrible and bring it to life and bring it so that you can live a life and make the decisions. Yeah, he, he definitely, um, what you say about the sense of freedom, he said, even if everything is taken away from you, the one thing that we can always retain as human beings is the freedom to choose how are we going to deal with this situation? What attitude do we adopt in this situation? And this is the freedom, uh, kind of the last freedom, which cannot be taken away from us. And um, this, these things that sound so deeply philosophical and almost abstract, they became very much real mm -hmm. and central to uh, life in, in, in such a situation. Uh, as in Auschwitz, he was writing, and that might be the reason why so many people still pick up this book yes. today. He was writing about suffering, 
at the universal experience of suffering, of suffering from injustice, the pain. The and it loss. wasn't just what he went through. It was about what he saw, what he experienced, how he helped people. Yes. That's rare. It is. Uh, it, it was not. He learned, he had learned so much from his patients. As you know, he grew up in, in Vienna uh, being a student first of, of, uh, of Freud and then of uh, Alfred Adler and uh, deriving you know, what are the uh, ways that people can be helped. He knew very early on that he wanted to be a doctor, he wanted to mm -hmm. help people. He then became uh, so passionate about this new science of the mind, the, 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 the open, opening of the doors to the mind that Freud had done. Uh, although he soon came to disagree with the ideas of Sigmund Freud, that everything is essentially just about us, about the ego, about finding pleasure or equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And that, that made him a fan of uh, a student of Ad, uh, Freud by the name of Adler, who was more thinking towards community and, and the individual also uh, wanting to contribute to uh, the world and to the people around him. And, uh, but the one element that was missing and that he uh, could see when he was working with, with people was the element of meaning. That if you have a why, a reason of why you are uh, living, and that can be something that you do, or that can be another person. Another person can be the meaning of your life, being there for that person. Then it's much more likely that you are going to be able to deal with the inevitable challenges and pain and suffering that comes in life uh, always for all of us. And uh, he used to say everyone has their own Auschwitz because suffering cannot be compared in that my suffering is bigger than yours. Well, that might be, well be the case, but subjectively, a person who's suffering, a person who has uh, you know, lost a love, beloved person, a person who has uh, lost their job, whatever is the, the most important thing that's suddenly gone, is suffering through and through. Mm -hmm. And so many people are, uh, are suicidal, are depressed, are not happy with their lives, are willing to uh, endanger their own lives because they don't see a task, a meaningful uh, way wow. to live their lives. And this was really the message that just got uh, confirmed, really, uh, through his experience in the concentration camps. In this day and age, oh, well, I have two questions. So in this day and age, I look at the COVID period we're in. Honestly, I've loved it because I was able to go through things and clean things and contribute to my community. You've been able to find people, document, take more time listening to them. Some people had a very difficult time with this being isolated and getting to know maybe your worst enemy, which was yourself. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing is, did, uh, do you remember hearing the name Albert Einstein in your family? Uh, well, he would mention him sometimes. Mm -hmm. Did he ever meet him? No. No. Unfortunately not. No. But, uh, yeah. yeah, he was another, he was another great one. Yeah. Alex, what are you doing now? What's going on I'm in your world? I'm enjoying this moment. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on in this world of yours? Oh, there's Tell, Let's talk about documenting. Can we talk about it? Sure. Okay. Yes. Documenting, you mean the, the work that I do mm -hmm. for? Mm -hmm. Your film. The film. The film. Yeah, so well, I'm so I'm, I made a film on my grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a project that I started over ten years ago, ah. and it really started quite, you know, almost like in like a coincidence. Um, I was being invited to speak on occasion in in instead of my grandfather, uh, even when he was still alive and he was getting up there in his years, he would send my sister, he would send me to read a letter and then mm. people would come up to me actually I was only I was 19 when I first read Man's oh, Search for Meaning. Oh you're kidding. Oh old. my gosh. I had no interest. I oh mean, my, no. I loved my grandfather but I was not very much interested in, in <laughs> you know, <his> ideas. <laughs> but uh, it was so uh, it was so impressive to me you know people coming up to me and say I I I'm alive because of your grandfather. Yeah. And I said what did he say to you? He was like no I never met him. I just read his work and that helped me turn my life around and I thought wow okay that you know I should maybe it's time to pick up uh, do a little more reading on sure. what he actually did 
And so um, I became interested in that. Oh, and yeah. people would tell me stories, and people who had worked with him, you know, former students, uh, patients, and, uh, and they would tell me all these stories that uh, were never printed anywhere or recorded. Unbelievable. And I was already, I was always a film buff, so I was knew that I wanted to do something with film. So I, I said, okay, can you, can you hold that thought, and I'm just going to get my camera really quick, and please say that again. And that's how this uh, project started, and wow. then it became a little, little film, and then I just continued. And every interview I did had at least one or two or more stories in there that really gave me uh, a clearer understanding of, of who he was. Mm -hmm. He was a complicated. He was a very. He was a brilliant mind. I think that it's fair to say that. Um, so that's a complicated multifaceted personality he wanted to be simple he enjoyed the, the simple uh, things in life the simple pleasures um, you know he, he was a mountain climber he loved that's to right. be up there in that's the mountains, right that's right uh, you know with with uh, mountain guides mm -hmm. to just be climbing be playing guitar in, in a hut um, those were the, the the best moments and I think that might be something that uh, you find as a character trait in some of the people that are not just not just smart but also wise mm -hmm. that those are the things what are the things that really count in life uh, the things that we do the things that we experience and uh, if all of that is taken away you still have the attitude that you can you can take and that can be which he really embodied at the end of his life to have an attitude of being grateful and saying, I've experienced so much. I can go in peace. This has been a good life. This has been, I could do what I wanted to do. I could write all the books that I, all the all my ideas that I thought would be helpful and meaningful to be out there. I had the ability to put them in the books. Something he, he, he didn't have when he went into, uh, when the Holocaust started. Um, that was one of the things that actually got him through. Uh, putting together the um, notes uh, about his first book, which he had the, m the manuscript in his coat, uh, sawn into it. He was still hoping that he could wow. preserve that because he knew that this was an important uh, th theory that could help so many. And he was, he was almost not so sad for himself, but for that message to not get out there. And so when he had the chance to um, reconstruct this manuscript on little pieces of paper that a fellow inmate had stolen uh, from him. He did that and he wow. kept himself awake in a night where he almost died of typhoid fever and he knew he was a doctor so he knew if he fell asleep it was very dangerous, unlikely for him to wake up. He kept himself going through that night by reconstructing uh, that book and then after the war when he came back reconstructing it from those little little notes that he had taken mm -hmm. and uh, so that helped him really he didn't enjoy life after that and he went immediately when he came back because he was so in shock he said that was the worst time that was even worse than the time in the camp because in the camp it was all about survival you kind of knew you know I need to take the next step in order to keep myself alive but after that the question became Nobody was waiting. Nobody was waiting for me. Everything that I had hoped for, everything that was meaningful, that gave me a reason to keep going, gave me a reason to survive, was gone. Mm -hmm. And all he had really were those little snippets of paper. And so he immediately started writing. And that's what kept him alive. You know, it's interesting because Ruthie writes, every, when, she, when she was in a different place in space, uh, she would take the time to write all the time. I have everything that she wrote, and I know that had to come from your grandfather. It had to. Um, survive, write it, document it. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, it, it's a huge thing. We in Chula Vista, and I am so blessed to be here. I say this a million trillion times. We take Holocaust education very seriously. And I think with my mom going to the elementary schools and talking to the kids, how do you tell a story to somebody who's that young? Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do if somebody comes and they take you that young? 
how are you going to work with it? And with Ruthie, it started with a hug that who is this person in a wheelchair? And then being able to tell people what the word discriminate and moving it from there, moving it from there. I'm interested in knowing how would your grandfather have talked to somebody, not in the intellectual college level, but how would he have spoken to somebody who was in elementary school? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, he, he could talk with anybody, really. Mm -hmm. He loved, and that's how I imagine your, your mom. What did we talk about earlier? Humor. Yes. There was this thing of humor that even when we interviewed the Holocaust survivors in Chula Vista, mm -hmm. the humor. And, and, and hearing somebody who was in a gas chamber with her mother and the gas not working, we're talking Lily Hecht, and, and Lily is like, and my mother said to me, oh, we're not going to die today because they didn't pay the gas bill. And you hear these stories. You can't document them enough because this is all we have. And I wonder, do I want to take my now 66 years of age and go to college again and study this, study this, study this, study this? No, Alex, my way of studying about the Holocaust is from our first generation speakers, our first generation survivors, the people that have opened up their heart to me. And now that we here in Chula Vista have documented the ones that we can talk to as we're doing the show, we've expanded. I've been now given the permission to bring the Holocaust survivors here yeah. that are not in the South Bay. And this is huge yeah. because the more people here, the first generation, I hope they live to be 120. We always say this in Judaism, but the problem is if they forget or they get to the point where they don't want to talk about it, then we're going to have a problem. And right now in my interviews, the most important thing I want them to say, if it's possible, I'm a Holocaust survivor, and my message of hope for the future is, there are a lot of stories, but the most important thing in my educating, and I will always call myself somebody who's in school studying, but the school that I go to is the school of the survivor. I don't know what's gonna happen after that. I think you and I have something in common. We collect. That's why we do this. That's why we do what we do. Yeah, just amazing. Tell me the funniest story or the thing you can remember the most about Grandpa. <laughs> oh, well, so many. I mean, he was, when you get to be 92 years old, you know, he, he had seen and heard so much. And um, he collected jokes like other people collect stamps or I know. think that's why he liked my father so much <laughs> are the jokes yeah you know in that sense he was maybe he was a born psychotherapist mm -hmm. um, because he was always finding ways to find something meaningful or if not meaningful and funny I mean that could be the meaning of the situation mm -hmm. when he talked about meaning he was talking about a very concrete meaning of a situation like us talking now right you know exchanging information that, that people can watch right mm -hmm. that's a meaningful thing and sometimes it's meaningful to 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 find a way to cheer to lighten the situation right, right? he would tell a story and apply that story oh he would tell it, it, and it, it, I'll give you an example yeah okay I, I'm going to imitate Dr. Frankel. I was taking flying lessons, and while I'm flying, the instructor is reminding me that when you fly and there's no turbulence, it's, it's a good landing. But when there's wind, you have the crabbing. The crabbing. C -R -A -B. The crabbing. C -R -A -B. I, yeah, the crabbing. And when you crab the plane, it's just like on this earth with people you have people you get along with but there's some people that need they're like wind and they they speak louder and they have more energy so you have to crab yourself 
to these people in order to get along. Did I say it right? No, but that's okay. But I like I like it. <laughs> okay, so explain that's it. Pretty Ex good. Okay, can you fix it for me? He would have liked it. Can you fix it for me? <laughs> he used he used. Uh, I mean, coming back to how mm -hmm. would he talk, and he would often use these metaphors or just images, uh, and make these connections so that we go, yeah, I understand now. Uh -huh. so, um, he said, if you uh, take. Uh, if you want, if you're going from from A in the airplane, in you want to land uh -huh. here, right? right. Uh, and you you put your, well, you would know what is it? Your you set your compass or whatever to that. Oh, you, right, right. When right. you're putting your 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 compass and when you're yep. aligning yourself up, and you know, you have to go say east, right? right? And then okay, so you fly. That's east, your compass, mm -hmm. and then and then you land. And uh, then, then, then you're there. Usually, that's how you do it. But if you have a crosswind coming from when you have a crosswind, north, you have to go even more and north. If you, if you put, yeah, if you put, mm -hmm. if you set the uh, the, the compass to which, east, which he said, you will end up <laughs> southeast. You will not end up where you are aiming at. You right. will be blown down. So what you need to do is you need to set your compass. Uh, a little bit north of that actual target, so you have to kind of set it wrong, right? To compensate for that crosswind, and you will end up where uh, you want to be. So you have to aim higher to then land where you really want to go. Correct. I'm glad you say correct, so that, that because you would know. Because because when it comes to people, my understanding now isn't this crazy. My understanding when I was reading this uh -huh. is. When you compensate yourself and you become extra nice, even though it's not what you want because you're looking at the target, you're thinking of the target, you're thinking you're going to crab yourself with kindness, you're going to crab yourself with understanding the other person. As you come in, you, you, can, you have a smoother landing. He would say that... I mean, you're, you're right, but it also transcends your own self. So why are you doing this? He said, if you, if you take a human being, if you take that other person uh, as they are, then you actually make them a little worse because uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a Correct, point. correct, correct. But if you take somebody as they can be, mm -hmm. Then you help them become who they can be at their best. Right. Then you end up. Then you you make right. What he said is you make them better. You start the journey with that person yeah. where you put them on a pl on a pedestal right. before you just think they're normal. You assume the best. The best. And then you then you end up then you are actually a real realist because that's who they can be, uh -huh. and that's how they really are. But you have to kind of overestimate them a little bit. Right. And he would always say, you know, if you take uh, humans as they are, you make them worse. If you take them as they can be, you help them become who they really are. Right. That, he would say, that not my flight instructor taught me that, and I didn't say that, but it was Johann Goethe, the Yes, the, he the did mention that. Who mm -hmm. actually uh -huh. said that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, so uh, how important is that as a motto, as a uh, uh, attitude to have uh, in your personal life, you know, with I don't know, you, if, when you're raising children, right? right? We know now. It's a, I mean, it's proven. If you tell Jimmy, "Don't be a brat. Uh, you are <laughs> such a brat," you you turn him into a brat. Sure. Right? Uh, what a good way to deal with patients, with clients. Yeah. Uh, to say and you know to to assume that they can do better than they're doing in this moment, and to know that and how reassuring. And he he had that ability to lift people up by that, by trusting them. I know you can do this. I know you can do better than you're doing right now. Right. I have no doubt. And by that, he helped them uh, you know, be a little better. Alex, will you come back? Absolutely. Will you? Will you come back to our beautiful Chula Vista? Yes. We're known for the best restaurants here, <laughs> the, the walks the here. Schnitzel, uh, the schnitzel. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll make you a schnitzel. schnitzel. OK, just so you know. In Judaism, when you have a Bible, after you finish reading it, what do you do? You kiss it. And I got to tell you, this has been a Bible to me. So, right, Ruthie? Thank you so much for being a part Thank of our, our lives, our future, which is part of our South Bay Historical Society and the Chula Vista Heritage Museum. I want to thank, again, Mary Salas and Joy Watley that they gave us this wonderful, how do you say, Shabbat Saturday that here we are talking. And Alex Vesely, 
You're incredible. Luke is talking. All right. Thanks Thank for so watching. Much. Cut.